are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. Well, welcome back to the Sense of Beer Style. This is the style cast. This one is, I think, I feel like I say this all the time, Julia. Uh, I, I feel like I say this, oh, this one's my favorite, or this one's really special. But this one truly, truly is special. If you're listening, if you're watching today, we're talking about California Common. We're talking about steam beer, the the beer that started the craft beer movement in America and therefore the world uh, that could easily be argued. Uh, the quick story on the steam beer, California Common. Uh, in in the day and age in, in America, post-prohibition, you could have any beer you wanted so long as it was yellow, so long as it was fizzy, and it came from one of three companies. And, and, it, and it was, and, 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 and all was well as long as we uh, uh, were trying to be just like everyone else. 1965, there was a brewery in San Francisco, Anchor Brewing, that was going out of business. It had been around since uh, the late 1800s, 1896, I think it was. And uh, Fritz Maytag uh, loved the beer that they brewed and didn't want it to go away. So he bought the brewery and, uh, and saved the steam beer uh, uh, from extinction. We're going into the uh, the annals of history. Uh, that beer was basically became the 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 ground zero for the American craft beer movement because it had flavor, it had color. It wasn't it wasn't brewed in giant factories. It was brewed by by people who were you know really putting their effort into it, and that sparked New Albion, and that sparked. Uh, uh, Sierra Nevada and so many others. And in this day and age, we have uh, Anchor Brewing's Steam Beer uh, as as kind of our the the cutting edge of of what we uh, enjoy as a craft beer movement. So this beer really is a special beer, and and uh, and I hope we have it forever. I will just say that at the time of this recording, you know, there's there are things happening, but uh, we're just going to talk about the style in and of itself. Uh, so that, uh, is our beloved, uh, anchor steam beer. Um, I, I was tempted to dive into how it's brewed, but Julia, I'm going to leave that for you and talking about ingredients. And I'm going to throw in there if you're willing ingredients and process, cause it's a very special, uh, thing. Yes, it is. And, and the baton pass also merits kind of mentioning bridging between the big picture and then onto ingredient and process. Yeah denoting the fact that the style and beer judge certification program guidelines is called California common. Yep. Jeremy's only really talked about steam beer. So that had to do with anchor steam wanting to basically own the notion, the style approach, the brewing process approach. If people made beers with that, that steam beer was, you couldn't call it a steam beer. So there was so much popularity though, that California common um, became the name one reason because this was a beer from Anchor Steam that grew uh, very broad and wide, not just in California, but across the U.S. and the world, frankly. Uh, so it became the most common beer in California for a while. And so California Common is what the style guidelines talk about. And that's because Anchor got the rights to call their beer steam beer. Um, think about Parmesan cheese, right? You, you, you have this orig origination that is, a, that is a mark. I'm actually against that approach. I think in the world of any beverage and foods, if you were to create one great dish as a famous chef, could you trademark your way into nobody else calling that dish that way? Like, it's like Caesar salad. And we yeah. have Caesar salad everywhere, but it was invented in Tijuana. You, we have to, it'd be horrible if we had to name it something different. Yeah. It seems to me not the spirit of everything else that I've, I've felt and learned about and been influenced by from Anchor Steam. So it's always just fair to note that there's a bit of a, <laughs> bit of a disconnect because we all had to learn about steam beer and start to say, why is it called California common? Even though people just talk about steam beer. So yeah. anyway, with that, go brew yourself a steam beer and <laughs> proudly enjoy calling it a steam beer. Yes. If you so choose on the, on the home level, but on the commercial level, you better watch out. 
and then with that characteristic ingredient, so pale ale malt. And, you know, malt is malted barley. Uh, it can be all their malted grains. But uh, basically, you have heat exposed to that barley to then transfer it, convert it to malt. So the enzymes are ready to be accessible by sugars with conversion during the brewing process and all that. So when I say pale ale malt, this is a base malt. It's the main fermentable that would be used in California commons or steam beers. And it's been it's been influenced by medium light heat, right? It's not the lower heat that Pilsner and wheat malts get, right? And it's not the higher heats that say, uh, you know, chocolate malts and the like that are used for porters and stouts get. So that's pale ale malt. And it is the base of this beer. The other part of this is because we're in California, it's always about the hops. And in this case, Anchor Steam very deliberately chose to use Northern Brewer hops. That was before the mm -hmm. citrusy, more aggressive, you know, Cascade and the like, um, the three C's, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, all that became on the radar. The non-citrusy hop of Northern Brewer is very distinct. If you have a properly brewed steam or California common beer, you're going to get this essence of woodsy notes, right? It's it's very, the only thing I can say is when you walk into the forest and it's just rained and you get a little bit of like, wow, I, I'm so close to the bark on all these trees and it's, 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 you know, permeating my nasal passages and palate. That's Northern Brewer hops. And that's what's very distinctive about this beer on the hop side for flavor and aroma. Um, and then you'll also get a little bit of toasted malt that kind of, I think, complements that Northern Brewer hops um, and or some crystal malt for sure. The catch with the brewing process that Jeremy queued up for me to share with you is all, all is um, lager yeast, right? So lagers were carrying the day, even in California, when you're a Fritz Maytag in 1965 buying this brewery and then, you know, in the 70s really getting a rhythm and rebrewing this very, you know, established recipe from the 1800s, lager yeast was what was used. However, it's a California brewery, right? And if you had toured or have toured Anchor Steam, it has open vat vessels, right? They're not quite like cool, sh cool ships. Cool ships come from Belgium. Cool ships are about the opposite of what Anchor Steam's about. Anchor Steam literally has their open fermentation vessels that are deeper and taller than cool ships in clean rooms. Clean rooms for anyone that works in space science or, you know, pharmaceuticals, they're rooms that you walk in with suits. And when you walk around the Anchor Steam Brewery, they have their white suits on. And the clean room is meant to ferment clean. The open fermentation gives so much more aeration, so much more oxygen to the beer, but it's not about the opposite of Belgian breweries that are using these cool ships that are open in not clean rooms. Those are in rooms that have lots of cobwebs and rooms that are open with windows. Very unclean. <laughs> yes, unclean. So think of almost cool ships, but bigger and taller in the, what steam beer is traditionally fermented in with lager yeast. So the catch is, is that you're fermenting in California. So you're fermenting lager yeast in a warmer temperature environment. So yeah. it's low ale fermentation temperatures for, for lager yeast fermenting, which is unique. And it brings out and elicits different flavors from your general California lager yeast. So that's enough on that because we could write essays and books on that whole topic, right? <laughs> Um, but just remember that warmer fermentation, you know, low ale yeast, 55, 60 Fahrenheit fermentation. So that's kind of the precursor to what we're now going to talk about in uh, aroma and flavor and whatnot. But Jeremy, yeah. you open the glass. Tell me tell me what it looks like and let's talk about it. Well, I, I want to say one thing because I, I think it was just brilliant. And, and forgive me, I don't, I don't think I have the quote just right. But Mark Twain once said that the coldest I've ever been was spending a summer in San Francisco. And, yes, and, yes. And, and so if anyone has ever been to San Francisco or at least the Northern California coast, uh, even the Northwest coast, uh, it, there's similarities there. Um, you know that it's anything but warm <laughs> and, uh, and, and, but it's, but it's not, definitely warmer than a refrigerator temperature, 38 right. degrees Fahrenheit that you're fermenting exactly. sometimes or 42. Yeah. Exactly. So warmer, colder. Now we're kind of splitting hairs. But if anyone has ever been to that area, you'll know, OK, that's the temperature that these yeast absolutely love. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the appearance. Uh, when I first poured this glass, for those of you listening, uh, I had a pretty good color foam on there. Uh, and uh, now I've, it, there's a little bit that uh, that is lingering on. Uh, and that, that, that's, that's pretty normal. I think a better glass, a better pour. I'm trying to, I'm trying to, uh, pour gently cause I'm standing over carpet and I don't want to get in trouble with, uh, the boss. Um, so, uh, I think we could rouse a little bit more uh, foam on this. 
uh, but we can expect a, a medium uh, off white head with fairly good retention. Uh, this is, even though there's a smaller foam uh, on here, it's retaining pretty well, but, uh, but we're looking at a medium uh, amber color. This is a, just a beautiful amber color, even leaning toward copper. Uh, we, we could get into copper. Uh, it, we'll talk about the numbers in a little bit. This is just this beautiful amber with just a touch of red in the color uh, from, from my perspective. And that, that's just a beautiful beer. But I don't want to spend too much time talking about the appearance on this beer. I want to get into the aroma and the flavors. Julia, talk to us about the aroma. Great. And the aroma really leads, at least in the style guidelines, interestingly enough, with the hops. And the way it's described, mm -hmm. you'd almost think they're describing German noble hops, which frankly is possibly what, you know, Anchor Steam was after, especially in the late 1800s. They were probably using hops for that recipe from Germany, um, or at least the um, Northern Brewer uh, strain maybe came from that. So modern to herbal uh, resinous, floral, and minty hops. And the word high, or, you know, it, it means intense is used. So moderate to high of that. And, um, that to me sounds like it's describing, uh, noble, some noble hops from Germany, but that's totally the classic, that resinous and herbal essence is Northern Brewer. You, once you, once you nail it, you're not going to forget it. And then you'll be able to identify it. Um, light fruitiness is acceptable because uh, fermenting lagers at warmer temperatures could elicit some essence of esters. And then low to moderate caramel or toasty malt supports the hops. I agree. This is a really, the aroma is kind of, I think, overly simplified. But the essence is, is that you're getting in concert with those hops that's been mentioned, some, you know, some essence of added uh, malt notes that uh, kind of support those, uh, those aromatic compounds from the hops. Yeah. And, and when we get into flavor, you know, uh, you know, we are talking about the Northern Brewer hops. That is the, the classic of this stuff. Uh, when you brew it, when you uh, submit it for a, a homebrew competition, the beer police are not going to be there. You can use some other, uh, hops with this. It's not going to be the same. Uh, but just know that the, the, the center of the target on this is Northern Brewer, uh, hops. And, and it's, it's a very distinct choice, um, in, in ingredients. Like you mentioned, Julia, when I taste this, uh, a, a, a great way to define this is, you know, just have this beautiful equal balance of hop character and malt character. When the malt, the story the malt is telling me is you have this medium, uh, malt that's standing on its own two feet, uh, side by side with the hops. I'm getting just a touch of toastiness. I'm getting a, a, a good handful of caramel uh, and, and, and just some like uh, toasty bread. It's just, it's just beautiful, but it should never be roasty. It should never start leaning into a uh, 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 darkly cooked or, or, you know, those dark flavors that we've talked about in other style cast should never go there. The hops should, can be low to medium high. So there's huge range there. But the uh, uh, but the hop flavor for me we mentioned you know woodsy rustic uh, rustic is one of those words that is used with this hop I think it was a uh, an early attempt to describe the American hop flavor uh, so it, but it doesn't really tell me anything what what it really comes out to is this particular hop for my palate tastes like mint. And it tastes like green lumber at a lumber yard that's not ready to sell. We need to let it cure for a year before we get it out there. That's exactly what that uh, this flavor is to me. It could be woodsy. You mentioned uh, going out in the forest after rain. That's wood. That's wet wood. That, we can put it that way. To me, that's what I get out of this. So, and we'll talk about uh, pairing this side by side, but put this next to a similar beer and notice that the the, the difference of flavor, the differences of aroma, and, and that will be a huge education. Uh, just to cap off the flavor, uh, it can have a fairly dry and crisp finish. I love that. It makes it just wonderful for uh, food pairing because it has so much character and then it just cleans itself up as it goes along. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, some light esters in there are perfectly okay as well. Just these little fruity flavors. I think that just brings it... Uh, or just give it so much character and, 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 and kind of fills out that experience. Um, but that's the flavor. Let's finish off with a mouthfeel and we'll, and we'll, and we'll keep going. Uh, yes, I'm going to be quick and efficient and literally toss it right back to you for style <laughs> comparison. Uh, medium bodied, that that's the class of ales that this is in, amber and brown American ales, medium bodied, right? Or medium to medium high carbonation. Uh, cholera foam is, is going to be not long standing, but should have some good uh, retention and likely off white. And that is very straightforward yeah, for, uh, for California common steam beer mouthfeel. 
What about style comparison? So style comparison, and I, I kind of alluded to this just seconds ago, but uh, to understand this beer, it, it, the best way to understand a beer is to compare it side by side with something. The the beer that uh, the best one for this to go side by side with would be the American Pale Ale we talked about in another style cast. Uh, gr grab a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, grab uh, an Anchor Steam beer, and put them side by side. Both of those are are uh, uh, from the same uh, relative era, and and they have similar flavor profiles. But what you're going to notice when you taste it is there's a very distinct difference in, in ingredient choices. They're very similar beers. But whereas Sierra Nevada Pale may use a Cascade hop with all that grapefruit uh, and, and tree sap and pine tree sap, the, the steam beer is going to have that mint and that green lumber or that uh, rainy forest flavor that we just talked about a minute ago. And, and it, it, it'll take some attention. It'll take some focus and some effort to really pull those two out. But, uh, but it, it'll be well worth that experience. The... Uh, uh, and so the, the steam beer also will have a little bit of change of uh, esters because it is a lager yeast that is that is fermented warm by lager yeast standards or or normal by San Francisco standards. It, it's not, the esters are not going to manifest quite as much as they would in a in a ale at a at a ale uh, temperature fermentation. Um, the 2021 guidelines kind of threw me for a wrench on this one. Another style comparison is they're comparing this to an Australian sparkling ale. Uh, and, and which, you know, I, I personally, I'm not going to lie. I kind of struggle with that a little bit. The Australian sparkling ale is just very bright, very, uh, carbonated, uh, very yeast driven, uh, fruity and wonderful. And, and this is just very, very different from that. But, um, you know, uh, out of, out of respect for the BJCP, I appreciate uh, the thought and, and I would be delighted to drink both of these side by side and see what, if, if I can find the connection there or not. Uh, but in the meantime, basically, uh, steam beer and American pale ale, those are the, those are the first cousins in, in every sense of the word. Uh, what about the, uh, the commercial examples? Again, very straightforward, just like my mouthfeel yeah. approach here. Cause there's not a lot, don't need to pontificate. Our goal is to just get you aligned and, and deepen your enjoyment of each of these styles and awareness. Um, commercial examples, anchor steam, as we've gone on and on about, yeah. and then Steamworks steam engine lager is out like, um, Southern Colorado. Great example. If you can find it, certainly always there. Um, and then homebrew one, if you cannot find a, a steam beer or California common, Please, please homebrew. Learn how to homebrew. I'm not just saying this because I'm your executive director of the American <laughs> Homebrewers Association while recording this, but because I truly believe that homebrewing really helps us calibrate on styles, especially the ones that are harder to find. So, Jeremy, what about vital statistics? Yeah, vital stats. Uh, real quick, I do want to throw that in there, especially with the homebrewing thing. You know, Julia, you're biased. Uh, so am I because I'm a homebrew and I love it. But as long as you can control the fermentation temperatures, then this should be uh, a fun relatively easy beer to brew. Uh, and when you go out to find them, uh, granted, if you can find, uh, uh, anchors steam beer, that's the, that's the uh, iconic one. Uh, but if you can find a, a beer that says like, this is a local one to me, uh, there's a, a honey steam beer, or if you can find a California common, uh, if you're going to brew it yourself, uh, basically all the, uh, uh, yeast companies that provide yeast, they have created their quote unquote any yeast that has the name California in it likely is the yeast for this California common. So, uh, so go forth and brew. Uh, let's see uh, the, the vital stats. <clears throat> let's start with the original gravity. Uh, this one is going to be uh, 1048 to 1054. And again, uh, you, if you're wondering why the heck should I know this stuff? Well, the original gravity just gives you a sense as long as it attenuates uh, fully and properly, that gives you a sense of what the um, the alcohol gravity, the ABV, is going to be, and 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 so if we take a quick turnover to ABV, so the ABV is going to be four and a half to five and a half compared to ten forty eight to ten fifty four. There's a strong correlation there. Uh, when we get to uh, 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 final gravity, then that's where we can get a sense of how well it's attenuated, how much body it's going to have. This one has some residual body to it. It, it, it finishes at 1011 to 1014. It's not super big, but there's enough body there that you can enjoy it. You can taste it. You can feel it. Um, 
when we get to uh, the, uh, if we're talking Plato, for all those who uh, live in the world where Plato is prominent, the original uh, Plato is going to be 12 to 13 and a half, they're about, and the final Plato is going to be about uh, about just under three to about three and a half. Uh, excuse me, and when we get to IBUs, let's talk about the bitterness there. So we're talking 30 to 45. There's distinct hop flavor in here. That's part of the character. That's part of the identity of this beer. But it's not so much that you need to scrub your palate with some fatty cheese afterwards because it's so bitter. There's 30 to 45. It, it's it's prominent, but it's not going to overtake you. When we talk about color, uh, and it, we use the SRM in the U.S., and so it's going to be about 9 to 14. So we're getting to the around the lower end of amber and just getting right up to where it starts turning copper right around 15. And so that is just a beautiful color for this beer. If you're uh, outside of the U.S. and using EBC, then we basically double those numbers and we're going 18 to 28. Uh, and to finish things off, uh, uh, for the, I should have mentioned this a minute ago, but if you are uh, people who use Play-Doh and you're talking about uh, the amount of alcohol, we're really looking at uh, just above 9 to about 10 uh, Play-Doh as far as alcohol goes. Uh, if, if, uh, if you uh, are not studying this, if you're not a brewer, then most of these numbers don't mean a lot, but you can use these numbers to play detective and figure out what your beer experience is going to be. So that's why we add them uh, so that you can understand what they actually mean. But let's move on from there. Let's talk about the glassware. And temp. Glass, glassware and temp. And so I think based on the ode to how this beer has been brewed, it's a rewarding experience to 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 enjoy this, not at 38 Fahrenheit, what is it, 10 Celsius range. You mm. want to you want to drink it warmer if you are going to get that essence of these nuanced yeah. and special, hard to find hops. Uh, drink this at uh, you know 50, 45 degrees Fahrenheit, fifty degrees Fahrenheit. It will it will start a cold. Like I always say, take take two, put one, sit it out. The second second one in your glass. You're drinking the first one cold. The second one's at this forty five degree, fifty degree Fahrenheit temperature. By the time you finish the first one, and notice the differences. Um, I think a, um, a a Nonic pint is a really good one to consider. One you know the English yeah. style pint. Um, I'm drinking kind of this California inspired. I've seen Drake's Brewing, which is who's yeah. branded this glass. It's like a open flared glass. My hand can warm things up a little bit at the bottom, but there's a bump on the top and really get an open essence and ability to uh, smell all the volatile compounds. That's what we want. Um, and we don't want anything that's going to stifle it too much. So I I'm pretty straightforward. I think that's my approach on this whole style is short, sweet, to the point, not too complicated. Yeah, and, and it, it is a style that that we can spend some time with, but but you know certain aspects. Let's just get right to it. Uh, when we when it comes to food pairing, uh, because this beer is so unique and so special, at least you know to many of us, not just to me, um, it, it's the ingredients that are very very specific. So I want to pay tribute and homage to these ingredients. So I'm thinking about that Northern Brewer hop we talked about. It does have a sweetness to it. So when it comes to pairing. You know, I, I love this with a, a just a beautiful grilled meat, but I want kind of a sweeter meat because I want to take advantage of the effect where sweet cancels sweet. And that to some extent where there will still be some sweetness in the background, but it'll take those beautiful Northern Brewer hops with that mint and that lumber that I love. And it'll kind of place them a little bit more forward on my experience. So I'm thinking like hot dogs, bratwurst, uh, stuff like that. And I especially, and I've done some research on this, this beer is fantastic with like a Korean beef bulgogi that is just very, very sweet. But but when you but when that sweetness cancels out, then you just get even more of that northern brewer hop flavor. It's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Good. What do you want and to then, add to that? Well, you know, pairing is a, a a big deal. And again, with my very straightforward approach on this, you don't want to, you don't want to overwhelm it. Keep it simple. I think this is going to be better with nuanced dishes. Um, take pork uh, loin as an example of, of a prepared protein that might be uh, much more immersive and, and, and in concert with this beer over say, you know, an aged dense steak, right? Um, cheeses, you don't want too much. Jeremy's kind of touching upon that. Feta cheese could be perfect with this, right? Okay. A lighter white cheese for sure. So yeah, um, I would also say wonderful mix of bar nuts, right? This is a beer that you would find no more often than not in its, um, you know, in my coming of age in most bars. And 
you know, that mix bar nut salty uh, amazingness with that that quenching beer at the end of a hot day is is one of the most perfect pairings, especially if you can drink it on a patio and, you know, pour it in a glass. Watch, watch out for light struck because your, your beer will turn self free yeah. if you're sitting in the sun with it in the glass too much. But that's, you know, some classic bar nuts. I love well, it. Yeah. And you just think about, you know, where did this beer grow up? You know, that which grows together goes together. So give me a, a some salty bar nuts and in, in a in a kind of a dark wooding brewery with an overcast oceanic sky is outside. This beer's yes. perfect for that, you know. It's yes. Just, let's just go, let's just go with it. I love but, it. Yeah. No, go ahead. Take us out. Well, I just think that's what we got. Um, don't want to overcomplicate things. Don't get overwhelmed. There's so many beer styles, 100 plus. Study them one at a time. Taste them one at a time. But don't skip this style, especially because, A, it established so many people's um, uh, search and adventure towards more full-flavored beers beyond your standard lagers. And it riffed on lagers in such a beautiful way. So it's a great style to get to know. And uh, cheers to you each for listening or watching. Yes. And cheers to Anchor Brewing. Yes. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia, and me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.